good morning senior colleagues and my dear friends outside i thank uh, and providence and joking center for giving me opportunity to present before you the topic given to me is drug induced thyroid dysfunction which is a, a good topic to discuss because most of the patients will be on some sort of drugs and it is interesting to know how these drugs are actually causing thyroid dysfunction if we looking at the functional uh, the anatomical point of view it can have effect at four points one is the pituitary level second is the thyroid level and third is the hepatic level and fourth is the intestine level so in the pituitary level it can cause thyrotropin suppression tsh suppression is both is done by many drugs hypophysitis is done by some drugs and there is a reduced conversion of t4 to t3 also is explained looking at the coming to the thyroid level it is it could be an increasing level of autoimmunity by inducing by by some drugs or it is a iron induced hyperthyroidism or many drugs most of the drugs does a thyroiditis the inflammation of thyroid and uh, many drugs causes it reduces the release of t4 and t3 at the hepatic level it is either the increase or decrease in the binding proteins which is mainly the thyroid binding globulin and decreased or increased conjugation of uh, t4 and t3 also there is increased biliary excretion also is possible at the hepatic level and in this time level it is mainly due to the absorption is uh, of the pill or the thyroxine is affected and um, rarely you can have increased fecal excretion as well from the anatomical if you come to the functional point of view the drug effects of thyroid can be divided into three major classes one is the interference with the endogenous thyroid function second interference with the thyroid hormone therapy third interference with the thyroid laboratory testing the first one is the most uh, common as well as most significant because it is directly dealing with the endogenous thyroid dysfunction the second one is the interference with the thyroid hormone therapy basically the thyroid absorption is being affected and third is the interference with the thyroid lab testing this is also very important because these patients are mostly u thyroid because of the drug action there is some abnormality in the thyroid function test so identifying this is very important because otherwise you may treat many u thyroid patients just because of the abnormal thyroid lab testing if you looking at the first one that is the interference with thyroid endogenous thyroid function the most common and most important it is can be various uh, Problem, various levels of problems so it can be it could be a disruption of hypothalamic pituitary control decreased thyroid hormone production or release enhanced thyroid autoimmunity and destructive thyroiditis then you have uh, uh, causes like increased thyroid hormone production changes in the thyroid hormone binding proteins and uh, thyroid hormone activation this is uh, t4 to t3 conversion is actually affected by many drugs and also displacement of uh, thyroid hormone from the binding proteins and uh, very rarely you can have uh, increased accelerated metabolism of thyroid hormone and more of elimination and some interesting facts about this drug induced thyroid dysfunction is that the same drug can act at multiple levels of thyroid hormone synthesis for example ctla4 inhibitors c uh, <coughs> Uh, T cell uh, uh, lymphocytic antigen 4 inhibitor. This is a agent which we will discuss more in, in the coming slides. It can act at the level of pituitary as well as at the level of thyroid. And another interesting fact is the same drug can affect multiple mechanisms. Again, the example is TTLA4, which at the pituitary level it is causing a hypophysitis. At the thyroid level, it is causing a uh, or in induction of more autoimmunity. And the same drug can cause hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. depending on the stage of the drug dysfunction and third many of this uh, drug induced dysfunction is uh, reverse makes a reversible changes or many are uh, permanent damage coming to the endogenous thyroid dysfunction the first one is the disruption of hypothalamic pituitary control so if you look at the causes or the case scenarios where drugs which are causing the disruption of hypothalamic pituitary control is the classical example is synthetic uh, retinoid the bixarotin which can cause uh, tsh suppression and uh, the, it will mimic like a central hypothyroidism a tsh suppression and subsequent decreased t4 mitotain which is usually used in the adenocortical carcinoma can again cause a central hypothyroidism like picture in about 40 to 70 patients percent of patients and most of them are actually a permanent uh, hypothyroidism central hypothyroidism 
and cytotoxic T lymphocyte antigen 4, CTLA-4 inhibitors, which comes in the class of immune checkpoint inhibitors, ICI. The molecule name is ipilimumab. Ipilimumab is anti-CTLA-4, which usually causes a hypophysitis, which will uh, clinically, as well as biochemically, and uh, imaging-wise, looks like a classical hypophysitis. The second level of uh, problem in the endogenous thyroid dysfunction is the reduced thyroid hormone production or release. And the classical drug is implicated is the high iodine containing drugs, which like a iodine contrast agent or uh, amiodarone or any other agent which having high levels of iodine, which will cause uh, increased levels of intrathyroidal iodine, which will inhibit the thyroid hormone synthesis and release, which is known as the wolf flake of wax. And this is basically due to the acute inhibition of the thyroid peroxidase. And most of the time, this iodine-induced inhibition lasts only for one to two weeks. This escape is happening in most of the cases, except in those patients who are having underlying thyroid disease like a uh, autoimmune disease or a patient who underwent a partial thyroidectomy. Can this effect can last longer uh, until the iodine load is cleared? And amiodarone, as we said, and lithium. These are the other two drugs apart from the iodine itself can cause decreased thyroid production, hormone production, and the release. And the third mechanism is inducing high levels of thyroid autoimmunity. We have many new drugs which are designed to promote the immune system targeting for the cancer cells and used in the cancer therapy. So most of them, these drugs can actually cause increased risk of autoimmune disorders, especially thyroid. So see, the examples are uh, C, uh, CTLA-4 inhibitors, and uh, programmed cell death uh, one inhibitors and programmed cell death ligand inhibitors. These are the other two agents. These two agents can act actually used in the as an immune uh, therapy can increase the levels of uh, uh, thyroid dysfunction, which is in the tune of five to twenty percent if you take both CTL and P uh, PD one inhibitors. Cytokines and almitizumab. These are another two agents also can increase the levels of thyroid autoantibody on treatment for various other reasons conditions. And uh, destructive thyroiditis is the fourth one. And destructive thyroiditis is uh, classically caused by drugs like amiodarone, which is due to basically a direct cytotoxic action of amiodarone on thyrocytes. And uh, this is uh, the reason for the autoimmune thyroid dysfunction or AIT2. And uh, the new drugs, which includes the tyrosine kinase inhibitors or multi kinase inhibitors also has associated with a high risk of thyroiditis. So these are the major mechanisms of the endogenous thyroid dysfunction. Now we come to the individual drugs which are uh, causing the problems. The most uh, described and uh, most uh, reported uh, drug is amiodarone. As you all know, amiodarone is a class 3 antiarrhythmic, which is uh, containing about 38 percentage of iodine by weight and it can cause thyroid problem at three levels. One, it can make abnormal thyroid function test, it can induce hypothyroidism and also hyperthyroidism. Usually hypothyroidism is described in those patients who are coming from an iron sufficient area and toxic causes in an iron deficient area. So the biochemical abnormality associated with amiodarone in youth thyroid subjects is when you look at the TSH, the TSH, we have to see it in the short term as well as long term. The short term TSH is increased. Why? Because as we said earlier, it is a high level of iron will cause a decreased T4 production, which is a wolf freak of effect. Second, the pituitary deiodinase 2, which is actually one enzyme which converts to T4 to T3, is decreased. So you have less T3. And whatever T3 we have got, we said got inhibited to, from binding to the pituitary receptor. So both these two factors will lead to a decreased uh, negative feedback. So you have more TSH. If you treat for a longer time, what happens? This gets normalized. One reason is that T4 production is coming back to normal because of the effect of uh, <coughs> wolf strike of effect is waning off. Coming to a T4 and T3, T4 increases and T3 is decreased. This is because the T4 to T3 conversion by the hepatic deiodinase 1 is inhibited by amiodarone. So you have more T4 and less T3. On longer uh, terms of long term treatment also, this doesn't go much different, but still you have a slightly increased levels of T4 or a high normal T4 while we have a slightly decreased or a low normal T3. And since the hepatic deiodinase activity is inhibited, what happens is the T4 is mostly converted to reverse T3 and you have high reverse T3 in short term as well as long term of uh, 
patients who want long, short term and long term treatment. Amidron induced hypothyroidism usually is seen in patients who have already got an autoimmune disease or patients who are more prone to get autoimmune disease, such as females. And what is the protocol described is you have to do a baseline GFT and, and autoantibodies. And also, you have to monitor the thyroid function test at regular intervals, say once in two months. And uh, this is the European Thyroid Association guideline for treating amidon induced hypothyroidism. So, you have to look at the, uh, the previous status of the thyroid. If you already have a chronic autoimmune thyroiditis, the chance that the patient may require a liver thyroidism treatment for a longer time. The normal gland, we should next question the can amidon be stopped? If it, is, if, if it can, we just stop it for, some, for one to two months and see what's the response. If remaining you thyroid, you may not require a treatment. If it goes to hypothyroid, you have the treatment, you require treatment. And those patients who cannot withdraw the treatment, you have to continue levothyroxine along with amidon. Hyperthyroidism or the toxic causes, amidon induced toxic causes, is can be classified into two types, one and two. Type 1 is basically due to the increased synthesis of T4 and T3. And uh, this is usually described in patients who are already having underlying thyroid disease like a latent autoimmune disease. And uh, type 2 is usually a destructive thyroiditis, usually appears in an otherwise normal looking or earlier normally functioning gland. Here the protocol again is to look, have to look at TFTs when you, before you start uh, autoantibody, uh, amadaron, and you have to look for TFTs and autoantibodies and looking at TFTs at regular intervals, six to eight weeks. Again, the European Thyroid Association uh, guidelines to treat amadaron induced thyrotoxicosis is like AIT1, try to classify them to AIT1 or 2. It's very difficult sometimes. So sometimes it will be a mixed picture as well. So if it's AIT1, Try to stop amadaron if feasible. But again, you have to be very cautious when you stop amadaron because amadaron, as we know, is a, has, has got a beta blocking effect and the conversion of T4, T3 is inhibited by amadaron. Once you stop, there's a chance that it may exacerbate the, so the, exacerbate the toxic causes. So if you can't stop and uh, you have to treat these patients with the thionomides plus or minus the chlorines and induce euthyroidism and uh, go for definitive treatment. And uh, AIT2, usually amidon can be continued, no need to discontinue. And you treat with them all the glucocorticoids, no thionamides over here. And once you uh, patient goes for remission, you just follow these patients. And some patients, uh, you cannot classify into either one or two. So those patients may treat with thionamides plus glucocorticoids, a mixture of treatment. And poor response, these patients have to uh, have a combination therapy, as I said. And once you make thyroid, you may go for a definitive therapy. Again, definitive therapy, there's a problem because most of the times you have to resort to a thyroidectomy because as we know, uh, as I mentioned, that the destructive thyroidectomy is the major pathology behind the toxicosis. So iron uptake is going to be very low. So radioiodine treatment may not be feasible in most of the cases. Lithium is a second agent, uh, which is uh, after amadaron. It can cause goiter as well as painless thyroiditis while hypothyroidism is the most common presentation. Again, it's most common in patients who are elderly, who are uh, female patients with a high thyroid peroxidase uh, and, uh, antibody. And uh, patients may require uh, treatment for a long time if the hypothyroidism is going to be permanent. And uh, during toxicosis, lithium-induced toxicosis is usually rare. And uh, posing mechanisms described are autoimmune or destructive. And uh, lithium induced waves is extremely rare. And because of the self limiting course, most of the time you require only a beta blocker and symptomatic treatment. And the thionomides are not usually indicated. Coming to the drugs which affect the protein binding of thyroid hormone. And as yes, we know, the most important protein is thyroid binding globulin. And the agents which increase thyroid binding globulins are oral estrogen, selective estrogen receptor block modulators, methadone, 5 fluorouracil, heroin, and metadin. Those who are decreasing the TPG are androgens, glucocorticoids, and niacin. The only thing is that a, work, a normally working gland, you know, there will be no difference because we have more TPG, more T4 is made, and the free T4 level is maintained. But those patients who are on a replacement may have to increase the dose because more, more uh, T4 is bound to the DPG and the free T4 level may drop. So we ha may have to increase the dose. This usually happens with the estrogens when you are using it in the oral group. Transdermal estrogen do not have this problem. And these are the drugs which inhibit or the, displace the uh, thyroid from the binding proteins, such as the anti-epileptic agents like fincho and carnosepine, and salicylate in a very high dose, more than two grams, can have the same 
effect. High dose furosemide, more than 80 milligrams of furosemide if you're using, you may have likely to increase the T3 and T4 uh, displacement from the binding globulins. And uh, heparin preparations also do the same thing, both low molecular weight and uh, conventional. And uh, the conversion of T4 to T3, which is the activation of the T4 uh, thyroid hormone, is being inhibited by amidarone, iodine, and ipodate and ipomac acid, and high dose of PTU and uh, glucocorticoids. Now, coming to the drugs affecting the metabolism, hormone metabolism are uh, that those drugs induce the glucuronidation enzymes, like, such as phenobarbitone, fentoin, and carbamazepine and rifampicin. Yeah, it will increase the metabolism of uh, hormone, so we have to increase the dose of tyroxine when you are using such patients. And the newer one described tyrosine kinase also has the same mechanism of increasing the thyroid hormone metabolism. Drugs affecting the excretion level is basically the drugs which affect the, bili by, uh, the bilateral sequestrants, which inhibits or which involves with the endohepatic circulation. Here also, you uh, have uh, low thyroid levels once you start on these agents, and uh, you may have to reduce the, we have to increase the dose of tyroxine. And this is one report from India which is saying that anti tubercular drugs, especially the second, genera the second generation or uh, uh, agents like ethionamide and PAS, that is uh, second line anti tubercular medications, paraminosalicylic acid and uh, ethionamide, has known to produce a thyroid problem it's in the range of about 25 to 30 percentage, and mostly in those patients, it happens in the first three months of treatment. And coming to the newer agents, we have uh, Three or uh, four regions I'm going to discuss. One is tyrosine kinase inhibitors, second is immune checkpoint inhibitors, third is cytokines, and fourth is almitizumab. Tyrosine kinase inhibitors are, they are the agents which binds to the ATP binding sites of both membrane as well as cytosolic uh, tyrosine kinase. And the tyrosine kinase inhibitors block the protein that, for, that uh, play a key role in the cell signaling. And uh, these, are, th these agents are actually disregulated in and derivated in cancers. So once you use these agents for the anti-cancer treatment, it can actually cause toxicity of thyroid by involving uh, the compounds targeting vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 1 and 1 to 3 or a platelet derived growth factor receptor. And the agents usually associated with a high thyroid dysfunction are sunitinib, serafinib, axinitinib, and vantitinib. And this can actually cause all types of uh, problems, like what you see, like thyroiditis, hypothyroidism, and uh, hyperthyroidism. And it could be mild, moderate, or severe. Of any intense, any kind of severity can happen. And uh, these are some agents and their frequency of uh, hypo and hyperthyroidism. For example, if you see sunitinib, is about 50 to 85 percent that can have hypothyroidism, while hyperthyroidism also is not uncommon, is about 10 percent. Compared with that, imatinib which is not acting through a PDGF or a VEGF receptors, so it doesn't have much problem unless those patients have underwent thyroidectomy. If you a normal uh, thyroid, it does not produce much of hypothyroidism, or there is no hyperthyroidism. But sunitinib, serafinib, and vantitinib have a high incidence of hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. Immune checkpoint inhibitors are the second uh, class of agents. So what do they do? The principle of immunotherapy against solid cancers is by amplifying the cytotoxic T cell mediated anti tumor action. So, there are some agents like which act as a checkpoints, inhibitory checkpoints, like program cell death 1, program cell death ligand, ligand 1, and CTLA 4. These actually will blunt the T cell proliferation. So, we want some agent which inhibits the inhibitory checkpoints. So that is one of the ICI, inhibitory checkpoint inhibitors. What it does this, this blunts this uh, act, the uh, inhibitory checkpoint activity. So you have more activated T cells and more activation against the tumor cells. So this is a mechanism by which the immune checkpoint inhibitors acts in anti-cancer therapy. And uh, these are the agents right now uh, approved. Anti-CTLA for monoclonal antibodies, ipilimumab anti-PD-1 monoclonal antibodies, pembrolizumab and nivolumab, and anti-PD-1 ligand monoclonal antibodies are atezolizumab, avilumab, and dermolumab. And this can cause hypothyroidism, teratoxicosis, painless thyroiditis, all is oral possible, and very rarely there are cases, even thyroid storm also is described with these agents. And the usual the level of incidence is about 6% of 
thyroiditis followed by hypothyroidism. And uh, this agent, as I mentioned earlier, can cause hypophysitis. So it may lead to a secondary hypothyroidism in some patients. And if you look at the PD-1 and PD-L1, that is the programmed cell death 1 and ligand 1, again, it can cause uh, hypothyroid, hypothyroidism in about 6% of patients. Hypothyroidism in 1 to 4 percentage, 1 to 7 or 5 percentage. And uh, if you look at the whole data, it is about 5 to 10 percentage. And there's a high chance that if you combine a PD-1 with a PD-L1 or a PD-1 with a CTLA, there's a high chance of uh, hypothyroid dysfunction, which is in the tune of 10 to 20 percentage. The pathological process here is usually starts with the thyroiditis in the first two, first one to two months. Later, it improves in the next two to three months and later goes to hypothyroidism by the end of six months. And uh, Graves' disease is extremely rare with uh, ICIs. So who are the patients who are likely to develop this thing? Again, female patients, elderly patients, those who are already have an underlying thyroid disorder, and a higher treatment period, you have a high likelihood of developing uh, thyroid dysfunction. And the combination therapy also will increase the level, chance of uh, thyroid dysfunction. Thyroid antibodies, antibody against TPO, antibody against thyroid globulin, or a pre-treatment high TSH do not have any, uh, not uh, feature as a risk factors. And this is a treatment for dysthyroidism. The, you have to monitor these patients up to six in the initial months. And until it develops the frank hyperthyroidism or a hypothyroidism, and you have to sensitize, sensitize the patient regarding the symptoms of hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. And lab test is to be done is TSH and KT4. And if you have TSH low and a high KT4, which is the hyperthyroidism, you have to look for the other causes of like, the, uh, causes like Graves' disease and toxic node levitator and the STA. If it is not there, you treat these patients with symptomatic, and um, many a times you require only beta blockers and the patient has got a grave this is something we have to treat like in the conventional cases like with the thionomides if the patient is with a hypothyroidism that is a tsh high ts with a low normal t, uh, with a low t4 uh between but tsh is more than 10 is better to treat and with this tsh is between 5 and 10 get an antibody and if the antibody is positive again you will treat these patients if the tsh is less than 5 you continue to monitor so when you have a normal TSH with a normal free T4, you continue to monitor the patients every two months. And one more thing we have to uh, think about because this patient can cause a secondary problem, secondary hypothyroidism uh, by hypophysitis. So you have to look at the patients with the free T4 low with a normal TSH. You have to look, think about hypophysitis. Cytokines like interleukin, uh, interleukin uh, 2 and uh, interferon gamma and TNF alpha. These things can cause uh, hypothyroidism and hypothyroidism. Usually, again, transient toxicosis followed by hypothyroidism is a usual pattern. And uh, these are known to increase the levels of antibody titer and antibody appearance in those patients who are previously negative for antibody. And uh, usually, very early it starts and it may process for longer time. And uh, usually, it is like, as I said, it's a painless thyroiditis. And then many patients go to hypothyroidism. Almitizumab is a Humanized uh, monoclonal antibody against cell surface antigen CD52, usually used in uh, multiple sclerosis. And uh, it is the mechanism of autoimmunity is said to be the lymphocyte reconstitution. And thyroid dysfunction is seen in about 40 to 45 percent of patients on elmetuzumab. And the Graves disease is the most common presentation with this drug. And one more interesting thing is that there are so many reports of alternating hypothyroidism and Graves disease with the use of elmetuzumab. Now, coming to the second class, that is the after the endogenous dysfunction, this is the one which affecting the absorption or interference with the thyroid hormone therapy is agents like ferrous sulfate, sucralfate, aluminum hydroxide, calcium carbonate, and proton pollinators. All this can affect the absorption of thyroid hormone. And uh, it is always advisable to space the agents with, when thyroxin treat treatment time by at least four hours so that the thyroxine absorption is not affected. And the last mechanism is the interference with the thyroid laboratory testing in new thyroid patients. We already mentioned some of them earlier. Now I will just discuss only one thing that is biotin because the most widespread and most widely reported now. The biotin is a part and parcel of the many of the commercial assays which uses free, measures 3T4, T3, TSH and TSH receptor antibodies. Because 
it's it, the measure of, it involves the process of bioaccumulation. And this can cause, reported to cause falsely low TSH, falsely high free T4 and high free T3, and spuriously positive T, uh, TSH receptor antibodies. Usually happens with a high dose of uh, biotin, like extremely high dose of biotin, like 300 milligram more. But there are some reports where even with the lower doses, like 10 milligram, also causing the same problem. So when you have this problem, what you have to do is you have to repeat the test on a different day. At least 48 hours to 72 hours have to be stopped, but it's preferable to stop for a longer time so your interference is likely to be lesser. And uh, this is a tabular column where we have uh, other agents which can cause thyroid lab abnormality in a youth thyroid patients. Most of them I already discussed, like amadarone, carbamazepine, enoxaparin, and fentoin. Biotin already we discussed. So this is how the drugs act, our drugs interfere with the thyroid laboratory testing. Thank you very much for your personal listening. Thank you.